not in health insurance now. Uh, I'm more into uh, supporting and facilitating, uh, creating community health entrepreneurs. Uh, so I thought that I will, uh, as the topic says, to talk about my journey as a social entrepreneur. I like to be called as an entrepreneur rather than social because there's, as far as I'm concerned, there is no difference between a social or otherwise. An entrepreneur is an entrepreneur because at a corporate level, at a for-profit level, you are also working as hard or let me say in the so-called quote-unquote social sector, we work as hard or even harder than the corporate entrepreneurs. And like Ramana very, very clearly pointed out, it was easier to raise five, five million being a, from a VC rather than trying to raise two crores from the so-called social venture capitalists. If you look at venture capitalists also, whether it is the patient capital or the in, inpatient IN or the corporate capital, the demands are the same. They expect 8 to 10 to 12 percent return on investment, whether it is from a social sector or from the corporate. Sometimes for a for-profit, it is much lesser than what they expect from a social sector. And that is one main reason I decided 15 years ago that we would go and proud to be an NGO, proud to be a non-profit sector. My journey, I guess, started in my childhood. Childhood, the schools that I attended, because we never had private schools. We either had government school or aided schools. If you're studying in an English medium, it had to be a government aided school, because there was no concept of the so-called private schools that you have today. And therefore, what happened was, and they did not have separate English schools, English medium schools. It was always one section out of five sections would be English, four sections would be in the regional vernacular language. Yes, I am ancient. <laughs> but that is how I grew up in a very small town near Velour in Tamil Nadu. But don't ask why there, because I neither belong there, not belong anywhere else. I belong to the world and to India. I come from that. That's my ancestry, unfortunately. And in my class, in my school, we played, we studied, we had good friends who were, whose parents happened to work either in our houses, in our homes, or with our parents, wherever they worked. So there was no difference. We knew exactly how our maids, what our maids' children ate, because we all ate together in school. We all had uniforms. We did not wear Reebok shoes. We wore slippers, and during playtime, we had to kick off the slippers and walk around barefoot. Our driver's kids, we walked to school with them. But unfortunately today, neither the schools nor the colleges have that kind of a integration. I never knew whether there was an affirmative action or whether there were SCs or STs or Dalits. It really didn't matter. It really didn't matter at that point in time. I, I guess maybe I was blinded, maybe my parents were blinded, maybe the schools that I went to were blinded to these borders and the walls. But today in my work, I see a lot of this, a lot of this. So that's how my childhood was, because it was a kind of an equal childhood, where it didn't make a difference. And my parents, of course, were in healthcare. My father traveled around the world, around the country, Bhutan, Nepal, and all these places conducting eye camps. And as children, we had to go along with them. My mother used to support him because she was a community health nurse. My father was a Brahmin from Haryana, married to a Christian from the south of India. 
blasphemy. Blasphemy. But that was our, we went to church. It really didn't matter to my father. Every day I sat in the morning with my father, cleaned up the puja room, did the puja with him, and Sunday went to church with my mother. I was fortunate enough to celebrate Diwali as much as I was fortunate enough to celebrate Christmas and Easter. I was fortunate enough to spend Ramzan, Eid, with all of my Muslim friends. Because the town that my parents settled was Ranipet, very close to Velour, dominated by the BD industry and the leather industry. And both the BD and leather industry was dominated by Muslims. So it was a great childhood where biryani was as much a part of our celebration as payasam and kheer and puri and aloo. And I was fortunate enough that my parents trusted me to decide what I wanted to do in life and gave me the opportunity to go and see firsthand what profession I wanted to choose. And therefore, I went to CMC Valor. It was just 25 kilometers away. We had to get up early morning, take the town bus, local bus, go to Valor, CMC. So I studied there. And that was a great institution to study. If people who don't know here, CMC stands for Christian Medical College and Hospital Valor, one of the uh, greatest institution in India, 120 year old. One of the largest, it used to be, and I think it is still one of the largest institutions, medical college hospitals in Southeast Asia today. They were the pioneers in focusing on the poor, the women. It was started for women. Dr. Ida Scudder started it for women. The first batch of medical students and nursing students were all women. Even now, the medical students, the majority are for women because when Dr. Ida Scudder started CMC Valor, her parents were in Ranipet. They were doctors. Father was a doctor, mother was a housewife. There were three people who came into the hospital. One was a Brahmin, brought his wife in labor. This is about 150, 200 years ago. The second person was a Hindu, again brought the brought his wife for lay in labor. The third one was a Muslim. They come in in their bullock carts from different parts of the district with their wives full term pregnant, ready for delivery. They come into the hospital because it was a missionary hospital. The south of India has a lot of missionary hospitals, so does Hyderabad. So the Brahmin guy says, I want to see a female doctor. No female doctor, only male doctor. No. No male doctor is going to see my wife. Took his wife back. Second person, same happened. The third person, same happened. And the next day, an Ida Scudder had come down to take care of her mother because she was sick. She was dying. So she was sick. She had come from the US. She was stuck. And the next day, they came to know all the three women had died in childbirth. That kind of shook Ida Scudder. She went back to the US with the resolve that she was going to go and study medicine and come back and serve India. And she came back, studied medicine for five or seven years, whatever, and came back and started Christian Medical College and Hospital in Velour 120 years ago. And that have produced a lot of path-breaking work, not only in research, but also a lot of path-breaking uh, alumni and serving I think the maximum number of patients today in the country and in Southeast Asia. So that was my starting point. So when I was studying there, and they allowed, they didn't preach to us, they just showed it to us as to why you need to be compassionate. Why, do you, why does one need to be aware of what is happening around and what the needs of the person that you're treating with, treating. After I graduated, I got married to an IT person, 
moved, worked in Bangalore for some time, moved to Bangalore. And then the flavor of that, of that particular period in everybody's lives was the land of honey and opportunity, the US. In my class, I had 10 students, out of which eight of them are in the US working. Did the exam here, went into the US, this was 93, 94. Every day I would go to work. I will look at a patient, I will treat a patient, and I'll say, what the hell am I doing here? I have been educated all my life. Of course, because I was studying in an English medium school, my father was a doctor, my mother was a professional, so we had to pay a school fees, and because it was again government subsidized, but minimal school fees. Went to college, that's again subsidized, because we had to pay a fee, but it was subsidized, cross-subsidized, like I'm sure all of you here, here in IIIT or wherever. So I said, somebody subsidized my education. And for a large part, the government subsidized. And the government's money comes from the taxpayer. And what am I doing here? I'm working. The education that I got, the skills that I have got, is from my country, which is supposedly at that time, from underdeveloped, we were moving to the developing phase. Not even phase, flavor. I call all of these passing phrases that become, catches somebody's fancy. And Every day I would go to work in the morning, come back in the evening angry or crying, saying that, what am I doing here? Because I'm in a country which is one of the richest in the world, which can buy the best of the healthcare, the best of the skill sets for the poorest of the poor people. Whereas back in India, even if you are rich, you cannot buy the skill set because the skill sets are not available. So after about a year, my husband saw me struggling with this because it was a huge struggle. And he said, you know what, if it's not making you happy, let's pack up and go back home. We packed up, we didn't know what we were going to do, we came back home. And we have stayed put. And like Ramana was saying, yes, I'm a strong believer in a higher power which guides you, which shows you, and shows all of us a road, it's up to us whether we want to take the opportunity or not. My husband, I have again been lucky for having been able to straddle both the world, the corporate as well as the development world. Because my husband still continues to be in the corporate world. You need to have a passion. You need to, I would say more than passion, it needs to be a calling. A calling that you want to do the kind of work that we would require to work in, I would say, inaccessible and I won't even say underprivileged because none of us are privileged. We are as privileged as the others in places where the so-called development has not reached. So fast forward back to when I started Healing Fields Foundation. This was after about 10, 15 years after I finished my graduation. I had my second daughter, my second child, my daughter, and I was sitting at home. We had moved to Hyderabad, being the tour guide, being the cook, being the driver, being the great shopper, being the guide to anybody, everybody coming, their Narai friends, family, extended family, and everybody else. So one day my husband comes home and he says, you decided to stay home to take care of the kids and the family. And what I see is you are neither doing this, you're being a glorified maid, glorified cook, glorified <laughs> driver. So I think you need to get back to doing something productive with your life. And pushed me gently to do my master's in healthcare administration. And that's what I, that's what I did when Administrative Staff College was offering MHA with St. Johns Hopkins University. As part of that, and here again, you want something badly enough, go for it. Push for it. Because they were offering only hospital administration. And when I went in for the interview, I was the oldest. I said, I haven't sat in a classroom for 15, 18 years. How am I going to go and sit in that classroom with youngsters like you? 
I already felt very old aged, having been married, studying two children. And uh, so we started. But my husband said, nothing doing. You'll have to go. You have to do something. You have so much to give to the world. You have to go. So I went in. And I said, I don't want hospital administration. I do not want to do hospitals. I want to go into the into healthcare because I am a firm believer that we need to prevent illness rather than. Oh, I thought I had for ten minutes. No. Okay, how many, how many minutes? Five more minutes. Sorry, guys. I've just been informed that I have five minutes. From thirty minutes, it's become to five minutes now. Fine. So that experience of being in Masters in Healthcare Management helped me because I went into the Charminar area as part of our education. I had to find my own professors. I had to find my, they, that's what Hopkins and uh, Askey said, you go find your own professors. So I said, okay, fine. I went and found my own professors to teach us. And I started with one, four others joined me. So we became a class of five for healthcare management. The rest of the 35 or I think 40 were all hospital administration. And as part of that, we went into Charminar area. And uh, this was in the year 1998. We, I went to Charminar area, started talking to this group of women to understand what their healthcare needs were. And one of the uh, women said, more than healthcare needs, it was how did we meet their healthcare expenditures? One of the women said in that, we meet through either mortgaging or selling of productive assets. And here, the yuppie that I was, because I'm doing my masters, I know all the answers. I have studied under the best of the institutions, the best of the professors. We have studied just about every book, so I knew all the answers. So here I went, asked them productive assets. Now what is a productive assets? Please tell me what can be a productive asset for a poor person in the Charminar area. Anybody? Milch cow? Milch cow? Yes, no, probably. Huh? Can a Charminar self-help group women have a milch cow as a productive asset? No, okay, what else can they have? If not a, a goat? No. Yeah, possibly a sewing machine, possibly a push cart, your charminar, you see all of that. So I assumed that that's what it was. And this lady looked at me and said, no, madam, my six-year-old son. I said, what do you mean? My six-year-old son, he was going to the youth track program school that was COVA at that point in time, was offering. And she pulled him out of school, put him to work in a tea shop for 12 hours a day, with one meal a day. For what? Because she borrowed 5,000 rupees from the tea shop owner where the husband was working to treat typhoid. I came back home that day. I couldn't sleep because my son was five. And I would take it out of my own, my son. Take it out on my son. If he didn't eat, that there's a kid there in Charminar who is, doesn't have this meal. He has only one meal a day. So after a couple of days like this, my husband turned around and said, listen, if you're going to be taking it out on your son, you, that's not fair. Please go and do something about it. And of course, I didn't know what to do about it. And later, one of the days, because my husband being in the corporate, all of us sitting together, he and his friends, all of us sitting together, I was a great entertainer. We were great armchair problem solvers of the social problems in the world, especially in India. That was a dot-com era, maybe some of you would have been just toddlers at that time. The Indians were fettered all across the world. Venture fund uh, capitalists would call Indians and say, you have an idea, you have a technology idea, and you want to implement it, come to us, we'll give you funding. And they were like, India was, uh, the technocrats were riding high on that. And at that point in time, the question that we kept asking is, India is great in technology, India is great in healthcare. We have some of the leading organizations and scientists across the world who are Indians. But how come India is still poor? 
we are still lagging in healthcare, we are still lagging in power sector, we are still lagging in education. And we started looking at it and decided to start Healing Fields Foundation and I took out of about 10 people there, I said, I will be, I will dedicate, I not dedicate, I will work full time on that. That's how Healing Fields Foundation started. And at that point in time, we went into Warangal, what Ramana Gogula was saying about Annalu. In 2000, Annalu did call us, and they wanted to know what our program was. But one thing I must give it to Annalu, not just in Warangal area, but also in places like we work in Jamoy and Kishanganj, we have been called, we have been asked, we have been said that, get out, you will be killed. But when they know that you are doing good work, nobody can ever put you down. They will support you instead. And we got into health insurance and micro health insurance and worked. We were one of the pioneers in micro health insurance in the country. And uh, we did a lot of process innovations and product innovations. And most of our processes have been absorbed into the government programs. And during the micro health insurance program, we realized finance is not the answer. Finance is not the problem. It is where do you where do you go and cash your health insurance? Only if there is a hospital. Many of the places don't even have hospitals. Many of them don't even know what you and I know. If a doctor prescribes a medicine, the first thing I do at least, and I'm sure most of you do, is Google it to see what the side effects are. The women and the community members in the villages, and the villages nobody even knows about it. So we decided to start something called a community health facilitator training in about seven states in the country. And today our focus states are the poorest states of the country, Bihar, Orissa, UP, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, some pockets in Telangana, some pockets in Karnataka, some pockets in Maharashtra, because very clearly we have decided to work only where there are low health, HD health development indices. And we train health entrepreneurs who become change agents in the community who reach out to about 250 families providing preventive education, creating access to the various government programs within the community, providing first aid, providing uh, products and services, plus also anchoring, accessing all the benefits that you have like water, sanitation, menstrual hygiene, Sanitary, napkin unit, sanitary napkins. We have trained about 3,000 women across 3,000 villages. The goal is to train 20,000 women in the next five years to be able to service. Each woman would service about 250 families. Still now we have reached 700,000. So that will be the scale. Looking at our program, today we have a partnership with Stanford Emergency Medicine to upgrade the skill sets of these women to become the basic care provider at the community level. The, the community health facilitator training program, the women pay us 100 rupees per month, but for the basic care provider program, they are going to be paying us 4,000 rupees. Is it sustainable? It's not sustainable to me. It's not sustainable for Healing Fields Foundation. Is it sustainable to the community? Is it sustainable to the woman, the entrepreneur that we are training? Yes. Because we are creating a paraskal worker in the community who doesn't have to be dependent on anybody's mercy or anybody's salary. She earns her own salary by providing health care. And do we use technology? Yes, we use a lot of technology. We use a lot of mobile apps. We collect a lot of data. We collect, we get the women to be able to use a decision support on the mobile app and be able to access all the products and services that is available. So, I'm hoping this will become the answer, not just for India, but also to the world in solving one of the major healthcare problems. I'm just going to take two more minutes. And the challenge to you youngsters is, there's a lot of technology products. All of the challenges are all based around the product. How do you get this product to the communities? How do you get the product to the remotest areas like Jamoy, like Kishanganj? 
deep forest areas, deep tribal areas, or for that matter, even in here, Srikakulam areas, Vijayanagaram areas. How do we get it there? Just, there are a lot of product. Uh, Akash was a great example. We placed for a thousand uh, Akash tablets, nothing came. Then they came up with the glucometers, which is like uh, for five rupees or less than five rupees, you can do a blood sugar test. Where are they? How do I access it? How do you market it? There are a whole lot of range of products that's available. And in fact, when I was just coming back from the US, Indian Institute of Science wanted us to partner with them because they have a whole lot of accessible, affordable, wearable technology which can easily be used for the rural and tribal areas, but they don't know how to get it there. So your job doesn't stop with just creating products. I would believe unless at least 10% of the rural population of India, 2% of your tribal population of India are using your products. And the, now the last thing that I want to leave you with is the biggest difference between for-profit and not-for-profit is NGO, I'm going to say NGO, is I can kill an idea, I can kill a program when I know that it is not serving the intended community. Whereas a corporation or a for-profit will have to continue doing that till the funds pull out. I have the liberty, I have the control, and I have the power to change that. And that should help you to be able to move into the social sector. Thank you. I don't think there are time for questions, are there? Um, like, I think we can open the session for three questions. Three questions. Uh, and anybody who has the solution is the reward they're declaring anything like that. Pra what do you mean by that? Okay, so there is a challenge. <laughs> Products are available, they are not being taken. Okay, so if they thought about, and you know, colleges, engineering colleges, anybody who design a solution for this one, the, here are the funds available, this is a reward. Okay. Is there any provision like that? From IIC? Yeah, anybody from, who has a problem. Yes, of course there is, right? The whole the Tata challenge is all about that. Tata challenge is all about that. You have, a, you have all these uh, challenges where you have your product and when you're able to pitch it, they are willing to provide you with the, with the funding. But if you're asking if that product to take it to these markets that we are servicing, I'm not going to do it for free. You're going to be making money on that. Sure. So when my community health facilitator or an entrepreneur is going to help you make your millions, share the millions with her. So it would be for a fee. Because if you're, if you're wanting to test a product, at one go, you have 3,000 women in 3,000 villages, reaching out to 700, 7 million population, so why should they do it for free? So, yes, there will be a fee. And that is where the profitability for the woman comes in. But for developing your product, you have your challenges, you have your venture funds, you have your incubators, whom I'm sure would be willing to provide you with the funds. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am, for telling us about the journey of a social entrepreneur.